talk this morning is going to be on multi rotors. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about UAVs, drones in general. Um, uh, my plan was actually to bring some smaller stuff. Uh, unfortunately, I ordered a bunch of stuff, and the package as of last night was in Memphis. So we'll see if it actually gets here today. If it does, then we'll have stuff to play with tomorrow. But uh, these guys, unfortunately, take a lot of room to, to fly. It's really hard to fly unless you've got a large amount of space. But we're going to try to bring some small stuff we can zip around inside the hotel and stuff. But, uh, we'll see if that gets here. But uh, we're going to talk to mainly today about multi rotors. So. so, first thing to talk about is just a little bit about me. I'm Ron Foster. It's my first time speaking here. Um, I'm a senior security consultant at HP Fortify Service. So, if you're familiar with that service, we, we break stuff. And uh, in general, I've been breaking stuff for a couple of decades. Uh, started my career with some microsystems back in the day. Became a technical instructor for them around risk architecture systems and network engineering. Then 9-11 uh, happened and Sun closed the national office as well as many other offices and that kind of ended that career. Hey, uh, if you're in Nashville, you know that Nashville is without a doubt a dotnet town for the most part, uh, trying to, especially 10 years ago, trying to get a job and anything that was not dotnet was nearly impossible. Uh, Memphis was the big hub there. So I went from there to doing a, a lot of uh, consulting around HP products for software development lifecycle, which involves a lot of uh, functional testing, quality assurance, security. So pretty much if it was inside of a proxy and we broke it, that's what I did. And then uh, about four years ago, I came on with uh, HP Fortify and I've been there ever since. So we hear a lot of talk about drones. Uh, drones is a very ambiguous kind of uh, statement. Because, you know, in the back of my van, I've got this little thing from a company called Parrot. It runs with two wheels. It's got a camera in it. You can control it with your iPad. It's an absolute blast. We'll probably bring it in here a little bit when we see it running around the hotel. But that's really a drone if you look at the technical uh, definition of what a drone is. Really all a drone is is some type of vehicle. It could be on, in the air, on the ground, wherever, that you remote control or that you can program to be autonomous in some way, form, or fashion. But we're going to be focusing on UAVs, which is an aerial vehicle. So it's an unmanned aerial vehicle. Uh, on the screen here, I have a Shearson CX-20. Uh, it is a clone of the DJI Phantom. I'm going to talk about the Phantoms a little bit. Uh, that's probably, if you've heard of drones at all, or, or, or quadcopters, that's, that's the big guy out there. This is an absolute clone of that, but it runs on Linux, and it's open source. And we're all hackers here, so we know what that means. So it's good stuff. Uh, and it's cheap. It's dirt cheap. So we'll talk about in, in dirt cheap in the context of the type of we're playing. Uh, How expensive is your dirt? Yeah, how expensive <laughs> is your dirt, exactly. Um, and we're going to talk about the autonomous versus piloted. Unfortunately, if you've been keeping up with the news, um, there's lots of fluctuation within the rules and regulations about drones. As of a couple of weeks ago, even, they came up with this grand scheme about new legislation, and we'll talk about it a little bit later in the presentation. So general uses of drones, um, or multi-rotors in our stand, in our talk here. Uh, military surveillance, as well as uh, other things that they do with military equipment, which usually involves blowing things up, but we'll stick with surveillance right now. Um, surveying, which is actually a huge industry right now. If you actually want to turn your hobby into a profitable endeavor, surveying is huge. Even in Tennessee, it's, uh, there's very few people that do aerial surveying, at least from a drone standpoint, and there's a huge market for it. So if you want to you know, the ground level is something where you can make some cash and fund a hobby. It's a really cool thing to do. Uh, search and rescue. I mean, I think we can guess the implications there. Earthquakes, things that, you know, wildfires, whatever. I mean, we have lots of issues where we can put drones in the air and we can actually see stuff now without harming people. Videography. I mean, we've all been to YouTube. We see the drones all the time on YouTube, taking the pretty little videos with the slow-mo frames and the pretty music. I mean, it's good stuff. But, uh, we have that, uh, and then we have this new thing uh, that a lot of Buzz is talking about. Uh, HP has done quite a few papers on it, the Internet of Things. And the Internet of Things is a beautiful thing for hackers because we know they are wide open and uh, also allows us a lot of fun with them. And, uh, there's a lot of uses within drones for that and general hacking. Uh, you know, we, we love these little Raspberry Pis and they're so light and handy and they can just attach to the bottom and all the Kali Linux image. It's beautiful. It's such a wonderful so we're going to be focusing on multi rotors so when I say multi rotor we're going to be talking on things with more than two rotors because if it's got two rotors really I'm calling it a helicopter so uh, so we're going to be moving outside the helicopter room here looking at 
uh, the multi rotors here. Um, the little, the little um, quadcopter I have on the floor here, I have Cherry Blossom, she's going to be my assistant, my daughter. Can you hold that up and show everybody the, the quad there? That's an exocrine, let's go with the quad. Let me just send you back to camera here. So, this guy here is, is a quadcopter. And this uh, screenshot here is a configuration of the software that actually runs on this, on this multi-rotor. It's using a, a piece of hardware called an APM. It's running an APM 2.6 to be exact. And when you buy an APM and hook it up, you can actually hook it to your computer and you can tell it what you're trying to build. And it will push the proper firmware to the APM so you can begin setting the program there. It also allows you to do cool stuff like say, hey, it's also a car, it's a boat. You know, it's very flexible in what you can do with it. And I'm a big fan of APMs. And, this model is actually deprecated now from a uh, hardware standpoint. They just released new firmware, and that model doesn't have enough onboard storage to hold the firmware now. So they're like, yeah, whatever the latest is, that's all you're going to get for us on that. And it's also driven the cost of that with a kit with GPS and everything below $100, actually in the $80 range, which used to be your biggest cost. So it's prices are plummeting on these things. But on the types of multi rotors, we have tri rotors. Uh, which would be this Y6 or the IY6 configuration. We have hex rotors, we have quad rotors, we have octa rotors, and you can guess the math there as to how many propellers they have. Thank you. Your typical configurations for quad rotors, which is probably going to be the most prolific type of multi rotor out there, is going to be either a quad plus or a quad X configuration. Notice also to make these things fly, you're going to have counter rotation of the actual blades. So you're going to have one blade on this side. If we look at the quad X configuration, the top, top blade moves clockwise, the right blade moves counterclockwise, and they have to be balanced in an X pattern to provide the lift for the craft. Uh, when you first start getting into these and you smash blades, which you will do, if you get into this hobby at all, make sure that when you purchase a unit, if you buy one, buy like 25,000 sets of blades to go with it. <laughs> Just saying. So the basic parts and components. When we look at these, this is actually a clone of what's something called a DJI flame wheel. And you know, and I think the, the frame cost me like 30 bucks. This is actually part of the kit. So when we look at the basic parts of this, we have the frame. This frame's a, a plastic filled fiberglass. That frame is actually very heavy in my opinion. Uh, that one's an aluminum frame and it's way lighter. Uh, in the future, I'm never building on this platform again. It's just too heavy, in my opinion. Um, the next one that we have are ESCs. So an ESP is an electronic speed controller, and it basically regulates the voltage to go into the motor to tell it how fast to spin. So more voltage, you know, of course, you're going to get more spin, more thrust, etc. You're also going to have some type of power distribution unit. On this one, it's actually soldered to the bottom of the frame. On that one, it's just a cable, because I'm, I'm learning I don't like soldering. And cables are easy. Um, controller or your TXRX transmitter receiver. On this one, the, the transmitter is right here. I have a couple radios in the car. I can bring those in. And then you have your radio itself. You have telemetry. This has a barometric pressure sensor built on the controller board. So I can tell it to stop at a specific altitude. And based on the barometric pressure, it will try to hold it at that altitude. But that's as, as intelligent as this model actually gets. And then, of course, the RXTX. That one has barometric pressure as well as full GPS capabilities. So I can literally say, stay exactly where you're at. And it will try to hold its position. You can walk up really and push it, and it will go right back to where it was. So it's uh, pretty cool there. So controllers, uh, one of the biggest areas that you just spend money, and this is the core of your craft, is a controller. So we have APMs, which you've heard me briefly talk about. We have NASAs, which are also extremely popular. And those are made by DJI. We'll get to the DJI spill in a little bit. Uh, we also have multi wees which is what this hexacopter is based on. We have KK2s, and KK2s are really inexpensive. You get them for 30 or 40 bucks sometimes. And if you're building it for the first time yourself, it's probably the best controllers to get because it has a little LCD. It's like four or five lines built onto the controller. So you can actually program the controller via the little LCD panel on the fly instead of having to 
push text files or hook it to your computer or do that type of stuff. So it's a really good first use board. And then you have CC3Ds, which is another really inexpensive board. ABM is made by 3D Robotics, and uh, the nozzles are made by DJI. They're going to be your most popular boards out there. And they're also going to have the broadest support within community forums, things of that nature. When we talk about our radios and transmitters, this is, I, I know guys that have $1,000 radios. Now, I have a child, so that negates any $1,000 radios. <laughs> right there. So uh, we look at $100 radios. And uh, I have a Turnigy, 9XR, which is the first guy here. That's a $100 radio. And the cool thing about it is, is there's open source front firmware out there for it in a large community. So basically, all the little bugs that were in the controller that people didn't like, they fixed them. It talks to you, which I find annoying personally. And they, uh, it's pretty cool stuff. Even though we could record her voice and have it scream things at me and actually plug that into the firmware if you wanted. You also have a company called uh, FR Sky. They have a controller called Tyrannus. Um, it's a little bit more money, but it's another excellent controller. It's about double the price of Eternity. But in a lot of ways, it's actually about the same. Because with Eternity, the way they're set up, you have a module that plugs into the back. I like that because I can switch modules out. The, Frost Sky, the uh, FR Sky Tyrannus is kind of all built together. But same thing, there's, there's firmware even out there for that. It's, it's a very fun controller. Then you have really expensive controllers, which I'm not going to get into. We have Google. We can look at that type of stuff. You also, when you look at controllers, want to see if the actual receivers can receive telemetry data, such as barometric pressure data, speed, altitude. Uh, some have battery sensors. Um, I'm cheap, so my battery sensor consists of a big, loud sound. Um, for about $3, you can buy these little guys here. When I plug my battery in, it'll actually read the cells in the battery. This is a four cell battery. And it will tell me per cell what the voltage is per battery. I can also program it to say when you drop below a certain voltage, start screaming like a woman unhinged. And it will do so, and you know to bring your quad down. Because if you don't, the worst thing in the world is to have this thing up in the air, no battery, and have it come crashing down. And all the beautiful time you put into it means you have to put more time into it, because we're not, it's gonna rebuild. Also, you're gonna crash. If you're gonna get into this hobby, be prepared to crash, and crash again, and crash some more. It's just part of the, part of the hobby. That's why I suggest the toy grade stuff to begin with and learn how to fly them and fly them well. She can fly probably better than I can. So, uh, also GPS. How many people heard of a thing in Kentucky recently about a, uh, a drone going over and someone shooting it out of the air with a shotgun? <laughs> Did you also see that that guy got let completely off scot-free? Did you also see the judge did not even look at the data or the testimony of the drone operator? Just dismissed it all flat out. So this is a problem, first in my opinion, because if we have a court system that is not going to let you present testimony, that's a big problem. Secondly, we have to protect ourselves. So when you build these things, most of them have logging functions. Make sure you are logging and make sure you're logging telemetry data. So if a guy says, yeah, you were flying over my house at 50 feet, but your barometric pressure sensor says you were 300 feet in the air, you kind of got something to go off of. If the judge will look at the information, that's kind of the thing there. So GPS is another thing we can look at, uh, have a GPS module in this. That allows us flexibility that at this point, per regulation, unless you have a commercial operator license is now illegal. Um, if you looked at a year ago, you could actually hook your drone up to Mission Planner, which is open source software, program waypoints into it, say, I'm not even going to fly you. I just want you to fly to this altitude, to this waypoint, this waypoint, and then come back and land yourself. And it was fun times. But now, technically, that's illegal unless you have a commercial uh, operator license. <laughs> My question is how they can enforce that. That's, that's <laughs> so, Get an operator license to let it operate itself. <laughs> I'll tell you, when they first started going to legislation, they said they were going to ban the charging for drone operation. That was one of the first areas of legislation. So what people started doing, friends I know that are doing this commercially, they did not charge for that. They charged for video editing. 
So when they were doing their surveys or whatever they're doing with the camera on the bottom, we're not charging you for any drone. We're just charging you for editing of the video we capture. So that kind of got them past the legislation. So uh, payloads. Um, when we build these things, they're fun to fly, but we also possibly want to attach things to the bottom. So one of the first things we want to look at is cameras. We all probably have seen a GoPro. Who has seen a GoPro or familiar with it? Okay, so if you have it, you want to see one, I, I have some I can bring tomorrow, you can look at it. Um, last winter, I had one uh, attached to uh, another drone, and we were shooting video of kids sliding down a hill, and the next day I took it out, it was during that big ice storm we have, and the GPS module failed on it, and it took off over a hill. So not only did I lose my drone, I also lost my GoPro. I think I was more hurt, hurt about losing a $450 camera than I was about the actual craft itself. So uh, for that reason, I began looking at cheap Chinese knockoff cameras, and also this little guy here, which is fantastic. We'll talk about this guy when we talk about cameras. Um, hacker payloads. I think we've all seen Raspberry Pis. This is one I use quite often. Um, how many people have seen the video of the drone with the Glock attached to it shooting on YouTube? Okay. I'm sure that's going to be great, great for the FAA also. I mean, that makes us all look good. Um, fireworks are great too. I'll tell you what, bottle rockets attached to a drone or, you know, running candles even. It's fun stuff. And whatever else you can imagine. I'm thinking more airsoft or paintball for future things. Uh, but those are plans for the future. So we talk about camera payloads. Um, we have a GoPro here, and the next tip beside that is this little guy here. This is a uh, fantastic camera. They're about $70 shipped direct from China. They use text files to control the parameters. You just put the text file on the card, control it. It's this small, it's like, that's it next to like a, a key fob type thing for your car, or at least from inside. So you see it's really small, it's really light, because one of the biggest issues you have with your building these things is weight. Uh, when you're talking about selecting motors or anything like that it's all based on thrust to weight ratios so you got to figure out what kind of payloads you're going to be hauling so the light is as light as you can haul stuff the better and uh, to get almost gopro quality for a camera that's under 70 bucks is amazing also this camera is a hacker's dream because if you notice there's two cameras here with different lenses you can actually replace the lenses it's attached inside with a little ribbon cable you can actually buy ribbon cables this long and attach the lens outside the camera if you want so if you want to attached to the front of the quad. They actually make little kits now where you can use them for FPV. Um, great little cameras. So you can come see me afterwards and we'll talk more about that. Um, it's called the Mobius. That's the last thing there, so the Mobius camera. So hacker payloads, we all mentioned the Raspberry Pi a few times, Beagle boards, and also I don't know if you follow Kickstarter or anything like that, but there's like tons and tons and tons of little tiny boards that will run Linux every day, and I think the possibilities are becoming endless for the types of things we can get in trouble with. So uh, when we think about our payloads, uh, there's multiple options. I'll show this, this is one I use often, it is running Kali Linux. The Kali Linux image for 2.0 is only about a gig. So you put your little 8 gig card in here. If you want to do some creative Python scripting, you can download the Google API and even you know have some fun with trying to log coordinates to Google Maps. I mean, there's lots of things you can do for or driving your neighborhood, or flying, whatever you want to do. So then this kind of brings us to the legal side of things. So if you, as of now, the, the one-stop shop for all legal stuff is the FAA website. So as of two weeks ago, I pulled uh, from this page some of the uh, main rules about hobby-grade drone flying. And basically they follow the same rules as you know, any hobby grade type of device in Tennessee. Now Tennessee's got some funny laws when it comes to hobby grade flying stuff. And a lot of it has to go back about 15 years and it all has to do with noise pollution. Because flying planes 15 years ago with meth based engines was really loud and sneaky. And uh, they didn't want these things flying in parks. They didn't want near people because I don't know if you've ever been to an airfield where we actually do play with this stuff, but people crash and burn and sometimes people get hurt. So that's kind of, the the situation there. So a lot of the rules we have today are actually based on the archaic rules from 10 to 15 years ago, even though most modern aircraft are using electric motors now. But from the FAA website, the first rule we have is we have to fly below 400 feet. And even though this is not on the FAA website, they also say that everything above roughly 90 feet of your house is FAA airspace. 
So you own the air up to about 90 feet above your property. After that, if you don't own it, the government owns it. So, you know, so you're basically your window is between roughly 100 and 400 feet to fly your craft as a hobby person. Is that ground level or is that roof level? That's ground level. Okay. Based on barometric pressure, et cetera, et cetera. You have to keep the craft within visual line of sight of all times, which makes APMs where you can program them and have them fly down the street by themselves kind of illegal. It kind of takes the fun out of it. You could probably still program it and play around and get stuff, but the fun was having it fly off into the distance and you praying to all the heavenly gods and come back and land itself. And uh, most of the time that works. But the other part of that as well is on this guy, I have a little 933 megahertz radio which connects to my laptop. So for up to five miles, I can track exactly where it's at in real time. And uh, so if it does go down, at least I know where it said it was last. <laughs> so I can have something to kind of go on. And also if you have those little loud battery things I was just talking about attached to it, by the time you get to it, it's just going to be going beep, 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 really crazy. You could possibly hunt down. We were, we were driving through our neighborhood one time and actually was just playing with the radio, trying to get the radio to re-talk to it. And I heard this in the bushes, like two streets over, and I walked up, and there it was in the bushes. When I pulled the camera off of it, it actually landed on the roof, bounced off into the bushes, and that's where it was at. So, oh, let me ask you the the, the the speaker that's going beep beep beep. When your motors have depleted the battery to a certain point, how long will it keep going with the beep until the battery depletes? How long do you? You know, I'd say 10, 12 hours. Awesome. I mean, it's just, I mean, because I have a set of three volts. These batteries are only going to run about 4.8 volts. So you've got a full volt to discharge. This is about 10, 12 minutes on this issue with one battery. And a, uh, so after that. And also, when you blew it off into the tree one, I was being okay, that. Okay, we're not going to tell that he's crashed away. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, that could be hazardous. It's okay. <laughs> I've got crash stories for you, too. Uh, remain well clear of and do not interfere with manned aircraft operations. So, how you know, when you hear pilots say, yeah, we're at 10,000 feet and we just saw a DJI flame wheel pass by me, there's a problem. You know, because that could get sucked into an aircraft engine, cause big, big problems. So it's actually not, not cool at all. These rules are there for a reason. Don't fly within five miles of an airport. Well, that's one of the reasons I don't like DJI. Because DJI, if you buy any new type of unit from them, I know we're hackers, we'll try to find ways around it, but it's actually really funky the way their firmware is written and if you in my own personal thing right now decompiling the firmware and trying to go through a thing it's you almost will tear out everything trying to fix the stuff that's in there but they've programmed it now where basically if it's in within a no-fly zone the craft will not be allowed to take off and that's also because i mean about a year was it two years ago that the uh, drone landed in the white house lawn that was a dji fan so since it was a dji fan on dji said we're going to fix this where this can happen again, which is another reason I like APMs, because there's zero controls on them. You go where I tell you what I want to go. If I'm going to create a virtual wall or a virtual fence and say you fly within this fence, if you hit the fence, stop flying there and just hold your position, I can program that right to the graph from all I'm talking. So I mean it's just, you know, for a hundred dollar control. Don't fly near people or stadiums. I think this is self explanatory. Don't fly an aircraft that weighs more than 55 pounds. And I'll tell you what, if you build one of these and you've got 55 pounds more than worth of multi-rotor, hey, you've probably spent over 10K uh, to get it off the ground in motors and everything else. And uh, you're in a different class than I am. She keeps saying, when are we gonna build an octorotor, Dad? I'm like, when I get a grant from the government. Because just looking at what it have to do to build an octo, we're talking, cheapest knockoff parts and you know four or five grand investment to make it right but um, don't be careless or reckless with your unmanned craft you can be fined for endangering people or their aircraft this brings me to the question of enforcement and we'll talk about that uh, next so as of monday october 19th a new rule came forth and they said that um, they still need to sort out the basic details of this registration system, but pretty much if it's considered a multi-rotor, you have to register it. The way that they're speaking at the conference and the way everything that I've read is written, that includes toys from Walmart. So if you bought an air hog, you have to register it. You're telling me they're going to require registration for millions and millions of toys 
And then how are they going to enforce that? I mean, really, they're going to enforce this on little Johnny down the road, flying his little guy outside. I don't see it happening. So this is about the fifth time we've went around and around with the government on this. They keep changing their minds. First, they were going to require a pilot's license <laughs> for hobbyists. Basically, it was good. You're going to have to go take this little one-page test to make sure you understand what it is, what it's doing. It wasn't supposed to be some super technical thing, but it was just a way for the government to track it. Then the outcry came up, and it went away. Then they came up with the basic rules. That stayed. Now this is happening and the outcry is coming as of now. So we'll see where this happens. They're saying they're months out from even finalizing any type of ideas about how they're going to go about it. It's more of a laugh than an outcry at this yeah. point. Uh, no, for the community it's still an outcry. <laughs> but it's a laugh, yeah, when it comes to regulation and enforcement. Absolutely. So we talked about the basic components. Um, but what we want to talk about next is regulations is why we can't have nice things. And that's because we do have people that fly in restricted airspace. We do have people that fly near aircraft. We do have people that fly near airports and interfere with rescue operations. Recently, uh, I believe it was a DC-10, is that the aircraft they used for uh, forest fires or the C-130s? I can't remember. But regardless, basically there was a large forest fire, I believe it was in California. A tanker went up, flame retarded, filled with it. They said it's roughly $10,000 a load to get that craft in the air with flame retarded. And the craft gets up and there's all these drones flying like within this facility. So the craft turned around and went back. They didn't <coughs> drop the flame retarded. They found the operators of those crafts and split the cost of getting that in the air and they find those operators. Mm -hmm. I think each operator got fined something like $4,000. How did so, they find them? Huh? Because they were still on the ground. I mean, they can't, you can only run so fast. I mean, <laughs> uh, I mean, that was a big deal. They're trying to put out forest fires. You've got operators all over the ground, you know, firefighters and everything. You've got the National Guard there. They're going to fuck. We're not impervious to that. Yeah. So this brings us to the question. We talked about basic components, but do we build or do we buy? Um, if you're just starting out on this, build. No, I'm just kidding. Buy, 100%. <laughs> and buy cheaply. Um, I'm a f fan of uh, direct Chinese shipment sites. Um, I've never had an issue with a couple of different sites, Alibaba, Banggood, I mean, they're great sites. And you can get a fully functioning multi-rotor about this big, shipped to your house, ready to fly, radio, transmitter, 200 meter roughly distance for 40 bucks. Buy one of these guys, piece of foam, a few rubber bands, and you have a full 1080p, almost GoPro quality setup to fly in your yard for, you know, 120 bucks with a reasonable and, uh, Are you talking about the like uh, DJRC? DJRC or the CMH We'll talk about specific models in a second. She's she's asking a question. Are you talking about specific models? Because she has her own little arsenal herself. So um, specifically, the SEMA H5 is a great one. There is knockoffs of that made by, made by JJRC, which I like as well. Actually, I think the JJRC models fly better, but they don't look as pretty. Uh, Ishim makes quite a few of them. Uh, there's just a lot of them out there, and they're cheap. So uh, we'll have the last slide actually has some, some list of those. Once we get outside the toy uh, range, though, we probably want to start thinking about um, where to buy. Uh, hobby King's another great one too. Another thing to talk about too is our local hobby stores. There's, there's, I think we have two or three now in Nashville. And uh, if you really want to perpetuate these hobbies, really, really, really visit and help throw those guys some cash. I mean, that's the best thing to do, especially if you're first starting out. It's great to order your parts from China or from wherever you're going to order them from. But in the beginning, go to those guys. They're going to give you all the help in the world. They're just as passionate about this stuff as you are and, and, and you buy stuff from them. Um, so as of this morning, if you want to buy, um, the Cheerson CX-20, which is the guy I had in the first slide, is under $250. This is the clone of the DJI Phantom. And it has a Linux-based APM. Uh, you have full USB ports in the bottom to connect it to your laptop with Mission Planner. This is the same telemetry module, 933 megahertz, that I have attached to that guy. You can, there's four headers on the APM. There's, just, there's quick two, tons of tutorials on YouTube about it. You can solder it all together. And literally, you have a craft now that you can track for up to five miles from your house with your laptop for under 280 bucks in cost. And if you tear it up, 
great. You only spent three hundred dollars. You did not spend two thousand dollars on a multivariate. I mean, it's, it's really good stuff. Also, being that it's an APM, and that's what I'm basing mine on, you get to learn the software. You get to learn how the software interacts with the hardware. When it breaks, you get to learn how to fix it. And fixing stuff is a precursor to building it yourself. And uh, just a lot of fun there. So I know this is an hour talk, but you know, I only have about 30 minutes of actual material here. I wanted to leave a lot of time for questions and stuff like that because last time we had quite a lot of people at Skyrim talking about it stuff too. So we'll start with this gentleman here. Um, the several of the models have Chinese clones and stuff, and they're different manufacturers. Are they at least having common propellers? Are there common components that are interchangeable? Actually, yes. I see the propellers are generally very common. Uh, so yeah, if you want to buy a JGRC H5 or a SEMA H5, they swap out. Worst case scenario, you're gonna have to take a drill bit or, or a little file and do a little massaging work. But that's that's about as far as I've seen them go, but yes. What you're gonna see is different is the radius, of course. The TX and RX is gonna be your big thing there. A lot of the other stuff, I mean, it's gonna be that the airframes look the same, the motors are pretty much the same, uh, and these are cheap little things, so you're gonna burn the motors out. Uh, if you wanna repair the motors, you can buy them, but for the cost, once you have the radio, most of the time they sell replacement craft in the $25 range for a craft this big. So, I mean, it really doesn't make sense in my mind to repair them at that point. It's just spend the 25 bucks and have another one shipped to your, to your house. Yes, sir. Um, are you doing a, a flying demo this weekend? Uh, we, it depends on what comes. Uh, around here, with all of the stuff that's around here, you really need big fields to fly stuff like this. Um, Around here with all the cars and people, we could be breaking all these little FAA rules. Um, as of last night, I checked at 5.30 in the morning, a package with a bunch of smaller ones was in Memphis. So if they show up this afternoon or early in the morning tomorrow, we'll have them here tomorrow. I was thinking you could take a small one into the agent. We actually uh, had quite a few small ones on that list. And uh, we have a bunch at home, but most of them are busted and broken right now. <laughs> and, uh, and is that a machine or which it's one? It's a Holy Stone F one eighty, I okay. think. It's great. It's like yeah, so that's another Chinese bucks, clone. And it's got uh, full H D video on it. Fantastic. Yeah, so it's it. good. Um, and I was like, yeah, I was wondering if they have a problem with me flying it around no, the atrium. Not. I don't. All right. <laughs> <laughs> that's what the staff. But that's actually the size of stuff we have coming. And actually we have a few pocket rotors coming. They're yeah. they're called pocket drones and the controller itself is about this big if you got cargo pants that fit into the drone fits inside the control yeah, yeah they're little hand size things have yeah. you ever been involved with the racing okay fpv racing so that's a great question so if we want to talk about fpv we talk about another class of multi -drones. first of all they're like a third of the size of that and this is roughly a 550 millimeter 600 millimeter frame those are mostly going to be 250 millimeter frames they're going to be about a third bigger than the one she held up it's about this big. Um, they actually are making now a antenna transmitter module for this camera, so you can run it as an FPV camera. Most people I know are going to use the Fast Shot rigs. Fast Shot rig, fully set up with the antennas, cameras, everything. It's going to run around 500 for everything you need to get started. Um, probably still going to run a GoPro if you want to shoot video of it. Uh, the video is not going to be the best, best quality because it has to come to you fast so you can fly it. So it's going to be lower resolution video. Personally, I've flown a couple. It's extremely disorienting for me. Extremely disorienting for me. I have glasses and everything else. Strapping a thing onto your head and seeing nothing but what that thing's seeing makes me want to hurl. So I, just, <laughs> it's, uh, I want to do it, maybe with a screen. Uh, it is something that me and her are going to plan a project around. But uh, these days, I'm looking for more ways to pay for a hobby than I am to uh, find ways to irritate my wife. So. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Um, I just want to make a comment. Uh, I, I know an FPV flyer, and he said that he learned backwards. He learned how to do FPV flying before regular flying, and he said it was incredibly hard to go the reverse direction. That if you're going to start out, learn how to fly without FPV gear, and then go to FPV. That makes sense. That makes sense. For, for me, though, like Oculus Rift, those types of things, he, Google Cardboard makes me easy. So, I mean, it's just, you know, it's, uh, I just can't imagine. You know, I think you, if you have any type of motion oriented things, that's going to be a hard thing. Uh, like I said, I'm going to try it with the screen next. Uh, we probably are still going to go fat sharp for the setup on that. I've also seen that a, uh, I don't know if it's Ishin or if it's who it was, but they uh, they also make a GoPro plug in now. It's just a board, plugs into your GoPro, antenna hangs off the bottom, you can stream directly from your GoPro. So that, that, that board stuff, they said, plugs stuff. So 
you're still going to have to have a receiver for that, which is either going to be a fast jump rig or some type of way to attach, you know, a tablet or a phone. Most of them are going to be Android based. Uh, the software that uh, I use, I actually was going to show you that. There we go. This is actually Mission Planner. This is the software that I use with the APMs. So if they, uh, it's free, you can download it. And notice that they've got all kinds of stuff here. Uh, you can do simulations. So you've got everything set up inside the craft. You don't want to actually take it outside and fly it. You just want to see if I hit a stick, does it actually, do the motors, should they run the way I'm saying the stick mm -hmm. should run? So you can simulate all that in software. You control every parameter from the thrust variables, uh, if you have balance issues because you have gear that maybe is a little front heavy, you can actually program it to compensate to the rear. Uh, you can set virtual walls, so you say this is the radius I want you to fly in, and it will only fly in that radius. Uh, you can set ceilings, say only fly at this altitude. You can program it via waypoints. If I had that plugged into my laptop and we could get a GPS signal, this map would literally change live and show you where it thinks it is on the map via GPS. So, uh, really cool stuff, and this is free software. So, this is the same software you said that you can like plan out routes. Absolutely. When it used to be legal, is it controlling it, or is it like uploading the plan and then it's it's flying? uploading the plan? Okay. But you can change it live. So, if you have the the uh, telemetry module installed, where you know in the United States our frequency that we're allowed to play is not under range. Overseas is in the four hundred range. If you're in the UK, so you'll see two different modules out there. Stick to the 900 range in the US. You know, it's kind of like the whole ham operator buying the five watt radio, that kind of stuff from a radio. So, range. if you have a ham radio license, are there radios that you can transmit on much further? That I can't answer. Okay. okay. Yes. Great question. But, you know, yeah. It's a great question. Do you know the data rate needed to sustain uh, live communication to the aircraft? I can tell you what it transmits at. It transmits at about 115 volts. Some of the land-based models use ultrasound. Is there any way, or have you seen anybody use noise canceling to get ultrasound to work with an aerial vehicle? I've seen them. I've never played with it, so I can't really talk to it. Uh, I would suggest you would be doing the same research I would be doing. I mean, that not, very few people are doing that right now. That's kind of new tech, and we're going to see a lot of that come down. With even with the new APMs, uh, the uh, the uh, uh, what are they call their uh, it's always always get those brain destruction things and the talks. But a, uh, they're a newer board. Uh, it's a black board. It looks kind of like a bone. I can't remember. They're about 200 to 300 dollars just for the boards. Uh, they're supposed to be supporting all that type of motion. I just wanted to add on to about the ultrasonics. The AR drone, uh, early fr French uh, quad rotor, uh, has an ultrasonic altimeter. And it, it you set whatever altitude it is that you want, and if you actually go and stand under it, it'll go up that many more feet because it, it's it's sensing it. It's not based on atmospheric, but it it only goes to about 40 feet because the it's not the noise of the props. It's just that the ultrasonic right. transmit just simply can't get a good echo unless it's snowed, and you've got a sheet of ice on top of the snow. Then the altimeter works really, really well on yeah, so 100 feet. So it's, it's, it's an AR product. Uh, yeah, AR. Okay, so. When we talk about AR products, a, uh, that's, that's probably a reason why they're toy. You know what? It's, I consider those fluids. Um, so I don't do a lot of it. The only pair of product I own is the, the jumping sumo. And they, uh, that's why I said we can run around here because they're just really sticky. Uh, it's a little robot that will jump 10 feet in the air. Of course, the jumper is broke on it. Uh, but a, uh, it does, you know, literally I can sit around here and I can drive it all the way around the thing and just see it from on. She's going to probably play with it. How difficult is it to take control of someone else's drone when it's flying? Okay, if you can hijack that transmitter frequency, then very easy. But the thing is now, um, with the 2.4 gigahertz spread spectrum technology, it's going to be a lot more difficult. Uh, I'm not saying it's not impossible, it's absolutely possible. But um, even when you look at the transmitters on here, uh, you can program the transmitters nowadays. Uh, this is a really cheap, crappy transmitter. I have a much better transmitter on that one because it also feeds telemetry data to my controller. So I can actually see telemetry on my actual radio, not just on my laptop. I can see altitude, airspeed, all that correctly on my controller. So this is great to fly. This is not really set up yet for anything other than the flying. So. Yes, sir. 
Uh, you said the one way of making money to finance it was doing the survey work. Is yes. that like surveying a property boundary? Absolutely. Or? Okay. Yeah, so if you got someone there, you know, like my uncle is off in Watertown, I'm fixing to do something for him. And he's like, this is where the state says property lines are, but I need actually to come out and do some measurements. And these things are running computers and they're using GPS coordinates. So you can't really get any easier way to make those types of things. GPS is actually enough to. It's, tie it's down within three feet. Most of them are good within three feet. And you'll see even the Cheerson, when you start playing with it, a, uh, and this is with all uh, GPS-based multi-rotors, one of the biggest mistakes early flyers make with them, they're gonna have little flashing lights on them. That tells you, the operator, that the craft is trying to get a GPS coordinate fix. So when you turn the craft on, and put it on the ground, it's doing this little flashy thing. When it stops flashing and it's solid, you know, hey, I know where I'm at within this 3D plane. If you, in any way, form, or fashion, don't allow it to get a GPS lock and engage any GPS functions of that craft, you will no longer have a craft. It will take off, <laughs> and you will never see it. <laughs> Good to know. Which is, which is why I lost my craft over the lake, because I think the GPS failed in it. Flight. There was something that failed in the craft, and a, uh, because even, even the way, I, the way the CX-20 and the way I have mine set up with the APMs, if you touch your controller off, I have mine programmed that if it ever does, if it ever ceases communication with your radio, come on. I literally cut the radio off, set it on the ground, and just watched it fly off and, and died on the little side. <laughs> yes, sir. What are the uh, top mistakes that beginners make? Uh, orientation is always a big one. Um, landing too hard is a big one. Um, I'm a big fan of pool noodles. Uh, it's you can possibly still find them at Walmart right now because it's, they're selling out all the like summer stuff. Go invest in four or five pool noodles. If you have a wife, just don't say anything. Just start putting pool noodles in the couch. But anyway, you just you know they're great because you can cushion. You can also put it on the arms of the aircraft so you know which direction I'm flying. Orientation is everything with these things. You have a front and a rear. You always want to fly with the front facing away from you. If you ever get disoriented, it's, you know, you're telling it to go this way, it's going that way, and things get really ugly quickly. Um, a lot of your newer aircraft have headless mode, they call it. And headless mode is for beginners, and it's a way that you can say, my orientation to the craft is here. So now, as long as I am facing this direction, even if the craft rotates a, on its axis, it knows within the 3D space where I'm at based on my orientation. Every single, even the professional commercial jobs I've worked with, that is accurate to a point. After a while, you'll start forgetting where it's at and you'll have issues. Uh, so really just learn how to fly. And even though I'm a pretty good flyer, I still use headless mode just to be goofy, just spin and then just try and move forward and spin. And if you're trying to impress the kids in the neighborhood, headless mode is fine. You can do flips and all kinds of stuff. Attach your laser pointer. Attach your laser pointer. Attach your laser pointer. As long as there's no planes around. Point them to the ground and look for cats. I mean, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Cow pasture's great. They like to jump the green beans. Any other questions? Well, folks, it's been a pleasure. Thanks for coming on my talk. Hopefully, it was good for you. Um, if it was, hit me up on Twitter and tell me you enjoy the talk. I'd greatly appreciate it. And uh, we'll be here uh, about half a day today. We'll definitely be here tomorrow because it's kicking off. So, uh, thanks.